Okay, everyone. So the creme de la creme are here. The rest of them are in the bar. On their, on their way, though. On their way. So uh, Andy Farrant, who is going to be talking about the whole truth. Okay, well, thanks for that. And uh, welcome to the first set of uh, science talks for this afternoon. Um, I hope all those in the bar are paying attention. Anyway, shall I move on? So, cave development. Um, so, uh, I'm just giving, not going to give the, the complete whole truth, but just some of the truth and some of the, some of the story behind cave development. So, um, caves, most, as most of you are aware, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some are small and pretty grotty. Others are pretty big and quite impressive. Um, some contain rivers, um, again, pretty big and quite impressive. This is Clearwater Streamway in Mulu. Some are big, dry fossil relic passages with no streamway in it. So, uh, again, a huge variety of cave passage. Some are very vertical. This is the Titan shaft in Derbyshire, and that's about 150 metres deep from the bottom down there all the way up to the top. <laughs> others are full of water, and you can only access them by cave diving. And others are just full of mud. So this is uh, up in Yorkshire. So huge variety of caves, different sizes, different shapes, different styles of cave development. Um, but a lot of them have one thing in common, that they're formed by dissolution. Now in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on those caves formed by the dissolution of a soluble rock. So I'm not going to talk about caves formed by um, volcanic activity, for example, lava tubes, or those caves formed by land slipping and gold caves, this is what John Gunn mentioned a bit earlier. Um, but I should talk mostly about those formed by um, dissolution of soluble rock. Um, and I'm going to talk, focus mainly on those caves formed by the dissolution of, of <coughs> limestone or dolomite by uh, <coughs> rainwater and, and flowing streams. So I'm not going to talk about coastal margin caves, which is what Fiona Whitter is going to talk, to, uh, talk about tomorrow, um, or some of the more specialist um, caves that aren't. So. Right, how do caves form? Well, most caves form um, <coughs> by... You need a soluble rock, that's either limestone, dolomite, chalk, gypsum, um, salt. Um, a source of acid, so that's what I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, only, <coughs> the exception to that is gypsum and, and salt, which are soluble in water, as opposed to you don't need an acid for those. Um, what a lot of people forget is you need a bit of time, quite a bit of time, usually uh, thousands to hundreds of thousands of years, if not, if not millions in some cases. And you need also a, some sort of kind of gradient to help push fluids through so they can actually <coughs> not only dissolve the rock, but also take the dissolution products away. So um, if you have all those in the right combination, then you can get a void. So, so where does this acid come from? Well, um, there are various sort of types of acid that can form caves, but the, by far the most common one is carbonic acid. Um, and this is derived from the um, from CO2. So what normally happens is you get uh, uh, rainfall picking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere, although it contains CO2, it's not very much, although it is increasing quite rapidly. Um, so the actual amount of CO2 that the rainwater can pick up from the air is actually relatively small. And, and in doing so, it doesn't actually generate that much acidity. Most of the CO2 is actually developed within the soil zone through the action of uh, bacterial uh, respiration, microbial activity, and, and de decomposition of organic matter. I'm sure Hazel will talk about microbes in a bit more detail um, later this weekend. So most CO2 comes from the soil, mixes with the water to produce carbonic acid, and that ends up dissolving the limestone or dolomite within the host rock. Um, and that's where you get most of your dissolution occurring at a, a soil bedrock interface. But, of course, some of that acidity goes into the fractures, into the joints within the rock, and uh, dissolves out the limestone. Um, <clears throat> there's a more complex equation if, you want, if, you're, if you're a chemist. So that's it in a nutshell. There are also other sources of acid. Um, the most common one is um, sulfuric acid. And this is a slightly more unusual um, way of generating caves. Um, again, quite a few ways of getting um, sulfuric acid in the geological environment, but the most common one is where you're getting hydrogen sulfide rising up from depths. Um, this is normally produced by the um, reduction of sulfate at, uh, within the geological formations at, within, within sedimentary basins. 
But if you're getting hydrogen sulfide coming up from along the fractures and joints and from depths, where it meets oxygenated groundwater coming down from the surface, you get hydrogen sulfide plus oxygen goes to sulfuric acid. Of course, if you're then in a limestone, sulfuric acid would dissolve away the limestone, and a byproduct you'll get, so limestone plus sulfuric acid plus water, actually makes gypsum. Now, of course, gypsum being soluble, it can also be transported away to make the void bigger. Um, but in some cases, it can actually be precipitated and left behind. And what you often see is that you get hydrogen sulfide coming up and also potentially carbon dioxide coming up a joint, hitting the oxygenated um, groundwater, and then you get big voids developed around your gas injection point. And you also get some condensation corrosion up at the top as well. So, so you get these uh, big voids developed around these gas injection points at or near the, the, the groundwater, oxygenated groundwater interface. And um, some of you may have heard of Lucky Gear, slightly uh, large cave in, uh, in, in the States that is very, very well known for its amazing formations. And these are all gypsum that has been um, <coughs> produced by that sulfate re re reaction and then also re-precipitated. I'm sure that Hazel may talk about some of this um, later in the weekend. But, uh... So <coughs> once you've got your acidity, you've got soluble rock, um, you can start to form caves. Now you can, you can kind of imagine caves having a bit of a life cycle. Um, we heard this morning how they have, already have a physiology, but they also have a life cycle. So it starts off with cave inception and through to enlargement and become mature. And then when they get abandoned by the formative stream, they, become a, they, they lose us, the, the water flow and become abandoned. And you start getting sediment deposition and sediment infill. Eventually, you either get, they collapse or get eroded away or they become buried. But if there's an uplift and all the valley cuts down next door, you can get rejuvenation and a whole new cycle of cave development inception at a lower elevation. So cave inception, where do it start? Well, it usually starts by, by groundwater flow along certain discontinuities. Like here you've got a good fracture. This is earth D. So you've got water coming down an initial fracture and gradually widening out those joints. It could be um, a horizontal stratigraphic discontinuity, like here, this is the chalk with a small sheet flint upon which you get small dissolutional voids forming. Or it could be uh, a thin shale bed, for example. This is the Yorkshire Dale, so you've got a thin shale bed here, and the cave development is actually formed by the, along that and then cut down. So these stratigraphic or, or tectonic discontinuities focus where the initial groundwater flow occurs and where cave, cave inception starts to form. Um, and this can take place, this, can, this inception phase can last anything from several thousands of years to even to millions of years until the conditions are right for the cave to, to become much bigger. The other thing that influences cave inception is also the type of recharge, so whether, whether the water's coming in via sinkholes or stream sinks through a porous overlying deposit like sandstone, um, but also the nature of the actual rock itself, whether it's, whether it's porous or whether, it's, um, whether the fractures are... Um, along whether, whether the, the discontinuities are fractures or bedding planes or through an intergranular matrix porosity. And that can influence the shape and style of cave passages. Um, in the UK, most of our caves are in the carved limestone, so they're generally um, very well fractured limestones with very low intergranular porosity. So you tend to get either <coughs> fracture networks or if they're along bedding plane partings, these branch work cavities. So this is kind of a typical cave that you get in the carbon limestone in, in the UK. Um, so I'll give you an example. This is Ockhoff Drynan. Some of you may know it in South Wales. Um, the joint pattern is essentially uh, north northeast, sorry, north northwest, south southeast, along this direction. Um, there's also two joints going that way. But when you actually measure up the, uh, the passages, actually the vast majority of passages are, are along this joint set. So this is a classic example of a branch work cave developed through along fractures as opposed to bedding plane discontinuities. And you can see a good example. That's the entrance there. Um, usually the smaller the cave entrance, the bigger the cave. It seems to be an inverse relationship. Um, so, and what's increasingly happening now is that with an understanding of the, of the groundwater chemistry, um, 
And if you don't understand the, uh, the, 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 the geological controls on, on cave inception development, you can start to, to begin to model cave, and cave development through using various programs and software. Um, so here's an example where somebody's tried modeling a cave um, formation. So at the top, you've got a series of fractures. And looking at, by looking at the chemical kin kinetics of the, of the water coming in, so you imagine water coming in at this way, coming in at this, this end of the, the model and flowing out to here. Initially, the water would go through all sorts of fractures and networks very, very slowly. But over time, as certain routes get enlarged, um, you'll get certain preferential routes will become the favor dominant route. Um, and over this kind of sort of 10,000 to 50,000 year time scale in this particular model, then eventually you'll get <coughs> your main route opening up. And one of the critical things is that, that when you're getting flow through a uh, narrow network of, of fractures that haven't been opened up, you'll get laminar flow. But as soon as that conduit's been opened up to a, a few millimetres wide, and you can allow turbulent flow within that, that uh, fracture, then the rate of dissolution increases quite markedly and you get um, a step change in the amount of dissolution that takes place. So, um, so the rate of actual cave inception it very much depends on the type of recharge, how much water is going in, the, t the type of discontinuity, um, and the type of rock uh, <coughs> uh, matrix porosity. So there's, there's various things that can, uh, can affect the, the timing of, um, and rate of cave development. So once you've got a conduit that's broken through from the sink to the spring, um, cave enlargement can take place and, and you, the passage can become modified and you have gradually get the, the void becoming larger and larger. Now, most conduits um, often develop at or just below the water table um, in what's called the phreatic environment. So this is below the water table here. Um, it's a completely submerged uh, tube, a bit of sediment on the floor. But if there's an uplift or the valley outside cuts down and the... And the, and the water table is lowered because of valley incision or mountain uplift, that phreatic tube can become drained and you'll get, uh, so this is your phreatic tube, this is peak cavern in Derbyshire, and the, and so this has been now been drained because the valley outlet's been lowered and the stream is flowing along the bottom there. Um, and with continued incision, you start to get a Vado's trench. So Vado's meaning above the water table and you're getting down cutting. So here you've got the phreatic tube there, but the river is clearly in cutting down and cutting a trench below the passage floor. And eventually, you get to a point where all you see is a very narrow, various trench, um, and you have to climb up into the roof to actually see the phreatic tube. So this is your, your classic keyhole-shaped passage. And you often see this, if, so if you just use your eyes when you're going caving and have a look around, you can often see this kind of typical passage morphology. There's your phreatic tube, and then you have your, your Vado's trench beneath. So straight away, you can begin to see things in the cave that can actually tell you about how the cave formed. And this is actually quite useful uh, for landscape evolution. And Mike Sims will talk about this in a bit more detail after, after, on the next talk. But essentially what you get is you get uh, a stream sink, and you're getting a conduit through to the spring. And this will be phreatic. Um, this here a bit with Vado's. But if that valley then cuts down you'll get a new spring outlet with a new conduit forming a lower down and the, and the old one will become abandoned and dissected. And that, that may happen over multiple times and you'll actually get a, quite a complex network of passages at different levels. And in fact, you can actually see that you know, there's your uh, phreatic tube and keyhole passage there and this is your active passage down here. So you can, you can begin to work out a sequence of passage evolution over time. Once you've got a conduit and the passage formed, um, things can happen to it. Um, outside environments may change. You may, may suddenly get a lot more sediment coming in due to glaciation, perhaps. Um, and you, you might have um, your Vedos Canyon, but then it might get stuff for sediment. And you might get um, a lot of passages being filled up with, to the roof with sediment. And instead of being eroding downwards, the passage may then start to be eroded upwards because of the sediment fill. Similarly, if you've got a phreatic tube and you've got a lot of mud coming in or sediment, again, the floor may be covered by sediment, so that only the roof's exposed, so the passage actually erodes upwards. Um, this here is Ogothum V, um, top series, and you can see all these lovely phreatic tube pendenty things in the passage wall. 
And these probably formed when this bit of passage was filled with sediment, probably during the, uh, one of the last glaciations, probably the Anglian glaciation. And water flowed between the sediment fill and the rock wall dissolved out a series of tubes. And since then, the sediment's been flushed out again. You can also get um, bypassing, you've got a phreatic loop like this, um, and the, if that gets bugged up with sediment, you can get passages going around trying to avoid the blockage. So there's a lot of things that could happen to a cave even after it's formed to, to modify it. And once a cave has then uh, been formed, it can then, as time moves on, the formative stream can find a new lower route and the cave becomes abandoned. So you start getting uh, yeah, sediment deposition coming in, you start getting speleotherms being deposited, um, and you may get smaller misfit streams coming in and, and washing things away. Um, and eventually you get to a point where um, you may get a huge amount of sediment coming in, blocking up passages, um, all these uh, nasty speleothem things growing up and causing, you know, blocking up the passage and so you can't see the passage walls anymore. So yeah, don't want too many styles of getting away. Uh, this is a nice example. This is GB Cavern. Um, and in fact, the sediment sequence here actually um, provides a nice sequence through um, a series of cold phases with a lot of gravel coming in, being sludged in by, by periglossal weathering. Warm period, a bit of calcite being deposited, another cold phase bringing in more gravel. So they're actually quite informative, these, these gravel sequences. And eventually you get to the point where the, the cave starts to break down and you start getting an awful, an awful lot of uh, calcite deposition such that you can't really see the original passage morphology anymore. But <laughs> through a combination of those processes, you know, the, the, the phreatic invaders passages and, the, and the, the valley incision and new lower levels of cave passage developing and changes in inputs, that can lead to very, very complicated um, <coughs> planned patterns of cave systems. So that's mammoth. Um, you've actually got multiple entrances, uh, multiple routes through that are all interconnected and at multiple levels to creating a very complex pattern, planned pattern with over 600 kilometres of cave passage. Again, this is clear water. Um, and you've got a whole, very, again, very complex network of passages, water coming in from there, water coming in from there, there, there. Initially going down there, down to there, but then gradually moving down dip at different levels to create a very, very complex pattern. But with a bit of you know, looking around and a bit of intuition, you can actually work out the, the process of how the cave formed um, just by using your eyes, really, and a bit of bit of um, bit of nails. Eventually, the cave starts to break down, so you're getting, getting collapse. Um, there's a nice cave system here in Slovenia. Um, it just hasn't got a roof. That's a nice big style boss there, for example. So, um, so gradually these things do, do um, become exposed to the, to the air. And you might get, you know, similarly, you might have a cave which then becomes infilled with sediment um, by, by downwashing from the surface. And eventually you get to a point where there isn't actually much left of the cave. So um, the cave's actually here, but it just hasn't got a roof. And that's what's left. And that probably won't last much longer. In fact, as you can see, there's a big crack in it there with the person at the top of the scale. So the other um, type of cave that you can get, that's, the, that's a typical classic normal cave formed by, by dissolution of, of rocks by normal groundwater processes. There's a whole other class of caves called hypogenic caves, and these are actually formed by water coming up from below. Um, so a very, very different style of cave development. Um, often associated with um, hydrogen sulfide um, acidity and spinogenesis, um, but also through deep um, flow through artesian aquifers. So artesian means where the, where the water goes through to depth, but it's confined by an insoluble bed overlying it, such that as, as you've got high pressures. Um, one particular type of transverse hydrogenic cave is called transverse mazes. These are particularly common where you've got um, a very thin, soluble bed of rock, typically gypsum, but not always, um, where you've got flow upwards from an underlying bed through the soluble rock unit and then flowing out into another unit above. So you might get flow coming up through this limestone here into the gypsum, dissolving out the gypsum and then leaking out through the top. And because this artesian flow is controlled by the fractures in the rock... Um, you actually get quite complex maze caves. 
And they're often combined to a single, to a single bed. Um, so you can see that you know, you've got these factories here bringing recharge up into this gypsum bed, um, which dissolves out and then flowing out through another factor into a higher level passage. Um, and this is a kind of classic example. This is um, some of these big gypsum caves in the Ukraine. Um, very complicated systems. <coughs> Usually very, very um, uh, on one single bed, with multiple junctions. But the other thing about these caves is they often have a very characteristic um, morphology um, related to rising flows. So you often find an input feeder um, and a classic sort of what are called cupolas. So you get this classic kind of Again, keyhole-shaped passage, but a bit more of a phreatic morphology than, than the others. Um, and uh, half-tubes and, and dome pits and all sorts of stuff. So very, very distinctive um, morphologies. Um, and here's an example actually from the UK. You can see here you've got this classic sort of keyhole-shaped uh, morphology, sort of cupola. Um, and you can see where all the passage has been eroded out along the joints, to form a very, very complicated maze cave. And this is, this is uh, from this is Hudgill Burn Mine Cave up in the northern Pennines, where you've actually got a very thin beds of limestone sandwiched between mudstone units. And what happens is that you're getting slow leakage of water through the mudstones up into the limestone, dissolving that limestone probably over many millions of years, and then leaking up through into the, into the mudstones above. And dissolving out um, the cave at the same time. It's almost certainly associated with um, lead and zinc mineralization. Um, so you've got Hugill Burn Mine Cave up here, but you've also got them in um, Divas Hole Mine, um, Windeg Mine Caverns, and other places in Northern Pennines. And the interesting thing about these caves is that they often have no association with the surface landscape, and often these are only being discovered through mine workings or where the surface is accidentally cut down through them. You can't, they're not entered by stream sinks and springs, but they're just completely isolated in, in, the, uh, in the geological depth. Um, the other type of <coughs> um, fibrogenic cave is also where, you've, again, you've got hyp hydrogen sulfide coming up. This is um, Cueva de Villaluz in Mexico. And this is actually where you've got, in, got hydrogen sulfide coming up, meeting the groundwater and, and uh, forming sulfuric acid. Um, so you're getting inputs of very um, aggressive water um, and then uh, dissolving that limestone. Um, <coughs> the limestone neutralizes the, the, the water, but the atmosphere above it is, is, um, tends to be very, very enhanced in um, sulfuric acid, which is, which is why they're wearing masks. And then you get these very, very complex um, snotites and other microbial organisms growing on in, in this environment. So, <coughs> again, uh, <coughs> Hazel may talk about this at, uh, later in the weekend. So, so going back to that first um, slide, so hopefully that you should all by now have realised that uh, this got <coughs> you can straight away from the photograph you can see that there's a lovely bedding plane there. You've got a lovely phreatic tube there, and you've got a radio trench beneath. So straight away you can tell something about the geomorphology of this cave system, that it was once phreatic, but it's now been drained. Um, on the roof here you've got scallops. These are dissolutional flow markings, um, and they're asymmetric, and they, they, their steep side, which is here, always points in the upstream direction. So from this you can tell that the water was flowing this way out of the picture. And this is from Lick and Licker in South Wales. So and I know the limestone is dipping to the south there, so actually that's, that's looking east um, upstream. So just by using your eyes and a bit of, bit of uh, common sense and a bit of intuition, you can actually begin to work out um, how the cave passage evolves. So and the other thing I'll say, I just would like to pay tribute to all the cave photographers who... who um, took some of the photographs in this. I think the next 50 years is going to be the golden age of armchair caving because 
you can actually see far more in the photographs than you can actually when you're underground. I mean, I think some of the photographs I've seen of, of Ogothan and D and other places, that you can actually look at the photograph and think, wow, look at that up there on the roof. I never saw that when I was there. So um, I think the next few years with the advent of laser scanning, and, and I'm sure in 20 years' time we'll all have our own portable laser scanner on our helmets, and you have fantastic 3D cave surveys. Um, and you can just do it all from from home and you'd be able to be, sit in your armchair and have people throw buckets of water over you and do all your cave gym morphology from home. So anyway, I'll leave it there and I'm sure um, Mike will talk about more detail about landscape evolution and, and, the, and the things we can do with cave gym morphology. Um, and Fiona Whitaker will talk about some of the more unusual cave development that you get um, in some of the um, younger carbonates and coastal caves, for example. So thank you.